Uh, there, we're live. there we're live great greetings fellow nerds welcome to another episode of between two nerds where my friend and co-host jeff tansura and i talk with prominent industry specialists about all aspects of the networking industry from protocols old and new to industry trends and drivers to up and coming technologies and of course things you should know to further your career hey jeff good morning Hey, Jeff. Great to see you. Always. Good to see you, too. And uh, I guess very first thing we should we should mention is uh, right there in the introduction, I said, where we talk to industry specialists and, and today's show is something we haven't done, man, in probably a couple of years, which is just the two of us talking that uh, for quite a while when we first did the show. It was just us talking about things before we had the bright idea. Hey, why don't we have some other people? join us and uh, so we've always had a lot of guests since then and uh but this particular topic is just going to be you and me um yep so just the two of us just the two of us isn't there a song <laughs> there is <laughs> it's a uh, so <laughs> i i'm just going to i'm going to laugh at myself here uh where this conversation started was um uh there was a um uh, a paper that was put out on LinkedIn that had my name on it. And uh, I apparently, uh, not apparently, I, I didn't do my editorial jobs as well as I should. And Mr. Tansura kind of dropped a ton of bricks on us <laughs> and said, hey, this section is wrong. And uh, out of all of that, uh, aside from me scrambling to correct things, um, you know, we, we kind of said, well, you know, the, the topic was, uh, was BGP in the data center and, and, uh, EVPN and, um, you know, which was what, uh, it was one of our first topics. And I, I think it covered several different shows, right. Yeah. Uh, uh, when we first started this, this show. And, uh, so we were just sort of chatting, um, uh, and just decided, well, maybe it's a good time to revisit, uh, what we talked about because it's been a long time and I'm going to let you talk about that part, Jeff, as far as, uh, what you were just saying right before the show started of, well, a lot of people don't know, don't really understand what's, what's happening in this space. And, and, uh, uh, it's not so much that, um, I, I think I, even in my, what I advertise this on Facebook, I said, yeah, we'll talk about what's been new since then. And, and you specifically said, well, there's not that much new, but, um, so, um, so what, uh, um, I'm, oh, I'm, Heather, the, the slides. yeah, yeah. Why don't we just jump right into the slides? So the interesting point in between shows has been three years, probably a bit more. Yeah. Uh, so just exactly after we done the kind of BGP part. Uh, I moved to Microsoft and actually been running, designing, troubleshooting, largest BGP network in the world, in data center. So a lot of experience and some really, really interesting stuff you don't realize unless you try it at scale. Yeah. So I, I, I'm going to try to share this with you. So let's see. There's some slides somewhere. Yeah, I've seen them. There they come. So name after famous movie. <laughs> 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 yeah. So I kind of remove the VPN part from here. We might potentially come back to it. And uh, I'll show you some similarities uh, between underlay and overlay designs and thinking. So IKEA preferences, uh, the underlay design would be mostly in context of RFC 7938, again, document produced by Routing Working Group, thanks to Routing Group for Chairs, <laughs> myself for Shepherding, and Peter and uh, Mitchell doing great work on it. So there's a whole bunch of documents uh, that 
if you are more interested in standardization side of uh, kind of underlay and overlay networks using BGP, that's here. So uh, the looking yeah. at the numbering here, uh, RFCs ninety one thirty five and ninety fourteen are they new since the last time we've talked about all this stuff? No, so uh, actually, a... so ninety one was published about probably two years ago. So they might be new. It'd be new from the yeah from the time we discussed. I I was thinking once we got up into the nine thousands that those were probably more recent, much more recent documents. On ninety one thirty six was already out for sure because we talked about RT five uh, in the VPN, so they were there. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, you're right. Because uh, if you look at uh, how ITF publishes document documents, there is usually some blocks. So in this particular case, you see RFC. 9135, 9136. There were a few more. They're published as a single block. Okay. Same on, uh, to... on, on 9136, uh, you know, when, especially when we're talking about uh, uh, type five um, uh, uh, route types, um, is that, um, at least in, in my mind, and maybe maybe my experience is, is uh, a lot more limited than what you see. Just you know, being both in a in a, a hyperscale, having been in a hyperscale uh, environment, and and also as uh, chairing the IETF uh, uh, routing working group, um, are uh, using type uh, route type five, uh, doing pure. Type five routes um, in uh, mainly for DCI is is that a concept? Was that around when we were talking about this before? I don't really recall. Yes, yeah, so it, it was. We okay. also have okay. uh, three four slides in the VPN section of our talk. Oh, okay, good. So what has changed significantly <clears throat> since then? And yeah, I'll provide parallels between underlay and overlay design. This perspective mm -hmm. is that VPN started as layer two over layer three in both. Service yeah. providers, so in PLS cases as well as data centers. If you look today, there's less and less layer two, right? Mm -hmm. So it might be due to legacy or ease of provisioning where you could use something that connects to provision stuff. Practically, there is no layer two whatsoever. So yeah. I would question whether you really need to do layer two at all, building pure route type five routed overlay makes so much sense. And for very obvious reasons, you don't need all the baggage that's coming with layer two yeah. VPN, starting from route type five and four for multi-homing route type twos. And by the way, you remember there are two of them. First mm -hmm. time you send type two when you see MAC address, then you send another one when you see IP address. Yeah. Right. So huge amount of state in the network. All the beauty of flooding, because remember we are emulating layer two bridge. So you receive a known unicast multicast broadcast, you flood. And flooding in terms of resource use on the switch is actually much more important component than actually holding the MAC addresses. Right? So if you're out, you don't need any of that. Most importantly, you can aggregate. And this is fundamental of healthy design to reduce amount of state and hide the uh, events that very low the layer. So for example, you've configured a new port. You've brought something, the port went up or down. Practically, if you aggregate at leaf layer, it's not propagated in BGP because BGP just sees a single stable prefix. Let's say it's less 21 if you have large enough switch. Right, so all of those reasons are significant enough to start thinking about removing layer two from your network completely if there's no need for it. Okay, so routing protocols. And again, I'm not going to pitch oranges versus apples and uh, you know, it's just for your own information. So pretty much we've got uh, three type of network. We've got Reap, that's pretty much dead. So distant network protocol, tell your neighbor rest of the network. We have got ISS SPF, which are link state protocols, and it's really tell the rest of the network, your neighbors. 
And then we've got BGP, that is Pass Vector Protocol, and we describe a path, a sequence as routing update triggers. Yeah, and when I, I, I don't think I even need to say it, uh, um, uh, you know, that I think anybody that watches this show knows it, but, but, you know, when I do introductory style BGP stuff, I always say, you know, that basically BGP is, it's distance vector except routing between, um, between autonomous systems instead of between individual nodes. Um, you know, but the behavior is a lot the same and obviously yeah. optimized for supporting some very complex policies. BGP itself, if you don't look at, uh, you know, all the various path attributes and all that stuff is, is really an extremely simple protocol. Which is exactly that. It's a deep use computation DPF protocol, right? Mm -hmm. So again, it's a pure comparison for sake of comparison. We are not saying what's better or worse. So in BGP case, we gather metrics as we traverse. So we had as numbers in as pass. Uh, so during the discussion, there was command both protocols flood. So let's define what flooding really means. Flood means you receive an update, you flood it to everybody else as if. BGP doesn't flood. BGP will compute single best route from its perspective and only pass or advertise this perspective. It's not going to flood all the updates it has received from the neighbors. So if you enable add pass, which allows you to advertise not only the best route, but next, 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 best, and so forth, you can emulate flooding behavior, but still vanilla BGP doesn't flood. It computes the best route and then it sends it to its neighbors. So there's reduction of state and it's kind of building the protocol. Locally, you need to keep all the copies because as we said, it will trigger rediffusion on changes. And uh, here we are talking about routes that made it into local RIP. Practically, you can also enable uh, storing pre-RIP copy. Uh, depending on your vendor, it could be software configured bound or Arisa has some different. Anyway, so you can also keep the copy of your address in RIP. Loop prevention is very simple and it's based on uh, uniform increasing metric. So BGP is direction aware. We always say it's ideal for policy rather than reachability. And we will come to that policy is very significant, probably one of the most significant reasons to use BGP and data center at scale. So, and let's be clear, if your network is six switches, you can do whatever you like. You can pretty much configure static routes, call it SDN and be happy, sure. right? So we are talking about uh, size, where scale, and amount of state becomes really tangible and you need to understand how protocol works, what it does to the state to choose a protocol. So it, its conversion is, uh, it's not slow, it's slowish. It really depends on configuration, on implementation as such from uh, how how you run your best pass to kind of basic multi-threading. You definitely want to decouple uh, uh, managing of neighbors from best pass computation itself from, uh, oh yeah, right? Mm -hmm. So looking at link state, we know it's the distributed computation to run like so the compute short pass. Yeah. It has number of topology elements, normally not linked in prefixes. So all the information within area or level must be the same. So when you observe LSDB, it should be similar across all protocol speakers in area or level. So packets are flooded across everybody to ensure consistency. And obviously you need tie breaking, so newest version always wins. Each node in level of area sees whole topology, and this is why it's so great for traffic engineering, 
because you know not only your topology, you know topology of your neighbor. So if you look at things like loop free alternative, it allows you to compute not only shortest path from you, but also shortest path from view of your neighbor and neighbor of your neighbor. So if you look at things like TILFA or remote LFA, you need to find a node that's inter intersection of PQ space. I'm not going to go into this practically. The fact that you understand that each node in the area or level is exactly the same topology allows you to perform so-called RSPF. So it's an SPF where you put not yourself in the root, but your neighbor or neighbor your neighbor. It allows you to compute uh, link protecting the free alternative, uh, not protecting the free alternative, or uh, intersection of PQ space. Again, this is where you need to tunnel your packets in order to get to the space where the distance to the destination is closer distance to you, so you don't lose the packets. So what's that about it? Every link failure shakes whole network. Right, so we can talk about optimization when you do incremental SPF and you do this and that. Practically, that the result and change topology. Everybody needs to know. Yeah, flooding generates really large, load in densely connected graphs. So if we look at traditional service provider network, you would have two three links here and there. Right, so the flooding wasn't really a problem because you didn't need to flood to many, many neighbors. Yeah. And uh, even to optimize that, we all remember a hack called, uh, we did it for ATM, I think even. Uh, what did we call it? It was some grouping in SS, remember? I don't remember the exact name, but we would group. Uh, I can't remember either. If you but can't remember, I certainly can. <laughs> yeah. You still have a functioning brain. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm getting older. So, <laughs> and then uh, in order to ensure that information is up to date, there's a flooding or refreshes, right? Mm -hmm. And again, flooding means you flood, you send it to everyone. Right. Yeah. And I mean, you, you look at, you know, even a, a reasonably simple uh, uh, clue topology for a data center. And, and it's very obvious what the impact of flooding is going to be on, on that kind of a topology. Yeah, so if we are looking at what's on the table today in terms of faster switches, we are talking about 51.2 Terra Silicon for shell buffer switches, mm -hmm. which is uh, Spectrum 4, Tamalk 5, and potentially some other vendors, right? So theoretically, you could have 256 up to 512 max. So it's 250 in one to one of subscribe topology, it's, it's 128 neighbor upstream of you. So this is amount of flooding you would need to generate. And then everyone else has again, 128 ports up and down. So when you start multiplying, the picture is really scary. I remember Tony Lee published the amount of flooding really graphically represented, looks really, really scary. Yeah. So it's, it's conversion really fast because you are not waiting for each node to converge. You're just flooding. The consequences of, uh, let's say, uh, locality independent flooding are micro loops, right? Because mm -hmm. not flood at different speeds, not converge at different speeds. So eventually you end up in a situation where two nodes have uh, updated uh, routing protocol databases, but not updated FIPS or forwarding. So they point to each other. It's well known for a man, it happens. It's not just academical exercise. So there's a number of solutions of it. Uh, most well known that became RFC about two years ago is uh, ordered a download of updates. So you know where you are. Since you know all topology, you can also compute distance to each peer. And then uh, you do kind of distributed election and you know exactly in what order you need to download updates and how much do you need to wait dependent on locality and distance to the originator of the update. So it works. We've got, uh, we've seen pretty good results on large networks. Practically, if you just flood, you inevitably end up in a micro loop situation. So kind of to summarize what I said, uh, 
if you look at lean state convergence, it's faster because you flood and process in parallel. Mm -hmm. If we look at BGP, you you update your neighbors only after you have processed the updates you have received. So if you look at every modern BGP implementation, it uh, so BGP forty two seventy one says only advertise prefixes that you are using and forwarding to your peers. Yeah. So all BGP implementations are taken in a way. They start sending updates at the moment best pass is done. So they are not in forwarding yet. And this is done for obvious reasons. We want to speed up conversions. And it doesn't often lead to issues, but there are pathological situations when it does. And this resulted in uh, pretty much every vendor implementing wait for BGP wait for install, this kind of stuff. So it really means that you are not going to advertise a route to your neighbor before you get feedback from forwarding. I received the prefix, I have installed it. I'm actually using the prefix, right? So it's not necessarily really forwarding. In some case it could be kernel, in some case it could be software feed, but practically it should be far enough and close to forwarding to respond back to BGP saying, hey, go ahead and advertise it. So this is off by default. I don't advise on using it. So you are, the only pathological case I have observed in my life here is when you use heterogeneous environments with different vendors. And then one vendor is sending updates to another, uh, to its neighbors. Yeah. And then it, it downloads routes in parallel, right? As we said. So mm -hmm. if your peer happens to be much faster than you are in downloading crowds into forwarding, you might end up in a situation that the originator of the route is still downloading into forwarding while its peers have already downloaded and start sending traffic to the originator. Because it attracts yeah. the traffic, obviously it the traffic. So in this case, you get really, really nasty routing loop. And depending on number of prefixes and speed of download, it might it might take a couple of seconds to convert. Mm -hmm. So definitely not something you would like to see. Practically, uh, with newer hardware and all the enhancement that went into open source software, you can really see it anymore. Because yeah. uh, we are getting really close to hardware capabilities and not just uh, BGP to rip to fit. Right? So you should think really three times before you enable this additional check uh, and really be sure that you actually do it for a reason, not that because you know someone else told you to or what forbid your <laughs> vendor, right? Yeah. Okay, so let's start with basic routing. We're not going to talk about EVPN again. I think there's good analogies between properly designing underlay and using route type only, route type five only design in overlay, but that's pretty much all of it. So. As you can imagine, I stole the slides from from Rust White. But practically, I changed it. It wasn't about BGP, but I changed it to BGP, and it's true. Rust always makes good slides. Yes. So it wasn't about BGP, so, but BGP is eventually consistent. It's always available in partition. So it doesn't really matter how you partition your BGP domain. The reachability within domain is still working. So. If we take OSPF and you disconnect from area zero, you're pretty much screwed, right? So BGP doesn't have this concept of transit areas. So it's uh, partitionable and always available independently of partition. It's also eventually consistent with emphasis on eventual, right? We know that internet never really converges because it's supposed to converge eventually, but because of so many updates and changes, never actually does. Practically, there's always eventually changes going on somewhere. Yes. So eventual consistency is a very explicit decision on building or designing your routing protocol, right? If you make things strictly consistent, uh, it brings a lot of implications with regards to synchronization and how you handle all the stuff. So I'm not going to go into details practically. Those are the uh, 
semantics of BGP if you look at it from kind of higher level perspective. So I send a location scheme and uh, that's actually what <laughs> Jeff described. <laughs> so it really triggered my, my reaction because I mean, it's not rocket science, we all know uh, mm -hmm. what we are trying to achieve in the Lispy networks. Yeah. So what what are the goals in Lispy network? We don't want loops. We don't want pass hunting and we want uh, free value routing. So actually no pass hunting is the result of free value routing. Mm -hmm. How do we achieve this? And again, we are following in uh, here RC7938, we just common sense, we are using ISN allocation scheme to prevent uh, pass hunting. So when we advertise prefix P from a BGP speaker, A0, it will be advertised to all of its higher level uh, neighbors. So in this case, spines A, B, C, D, 1. So what happens after that, each spine will send BGP updates to all other leads. And depending on implementation, some implementation will look into IS, into IS update and uh, say, hey, I'm not going to send it to you because you're already in S pass, it's a loop. Some other implementation will not look. And that's mostly because of uh, grouping and uh, efficiency of BGP update padding. So you want to push as much stuff and as quick as possible. Because again, remember we all do grouping. So since uh, all updates are exactly the same, they follow the same policies outbound, you can create so-called update groups. So in the earlier days, you would need to group them explicitly, so-called uh, peer groups. Now, update groups are created automatically by software for you. So practically, there's only update one update generated and you send it to everybody else. So after Spines advertise uh, all the routes back to other leaves, we've got uh, consistency. All the routes are also advertised to another side of data center, so to the layer of leaves at, uh, uh, at stage two, but this is irrelevant for the discussion. So what's happening after that, each leaf has received an update. And since we are using the unique essence, it will accept the update. However, as we said, spines are in the same ISN across all spines in the pod. So again, depending on implementation, some implementation will send update up, some will just drop it. Practically, when spine layer receives an update, it will see its own IS number in the update because when you receive it first time, you add your ISN, that's how BGP works, right? So mm -hmm. it's a loop detection. At this point in time, spines are going to drop all the updates. So you end up with one copy, right? Because otherwise, imagine they are all in different ISNs. They'll send all the updates back to all the leaves. Mm -hmm. Leaves will send them back to all the spines outside of ones that advertise, so n minus one, and so forth. So when you start computing best path, when there is a change in reachability, you will do exactly what we call pass hunting. So you will find one and then longer, longer. So you will keep doing it till you run out of passes. So yeah. we definitely want to avoid this behavior. It gives us much faster conversions, reduce the amount of routing state, and it's kind of fundamental to good BGP design. So if we sure. go back here. This is how and it's, you... It's leveraging, you know, th that extremely simple uh, BGP loop avoidance also. Um, you know, you don't need elaborate policies behind that, um, beyond that. Yeah, so uh, I think if we look into earlier days, a lot of people would actually configure 
different ASNs everywhere and then configure policies to drop updates that come up. This is error prone and that's definitely not something you should be doing. Let BGP do its job. Yep. So I've seen a couple of deployments where you use a single ASN on all leaves. That's mostly done for provisioning reasons and then you use allow ASN and uh, it works because then you start counting number of ISNs and normally we configure allow ISN one. So if there's more than one ISN the S path that is same as yours, you'll drop it. So it works practically, it's a hack and I don't necessarily like it, so I wouldn't advise. This is much cleaner approach and guess what? This is how Microsoft network looks like. Right? So, So IP allocation schema. So what are our goals here? We would like to reduce amount of routes. And the only safe place to aggregate if you don't do any tricks with BGP is really the Tor itself. If you start aggregating anywhere else, um, you will end up with black holing because on next next hop failure and aggregation, you wouldn't know that you shouldn't be sending traffic towards particular destinations over particular spine. But since you have aggregated, so there's loss of granularity, you'll be just dropping traffic, right? Okay, so we aggregate on TORS. Our goal is really to reduce number of routes. So the less routes, the faster the conversion. You have less stuff to send to your neighbors. You have less stuff to download and to forwarding. Practically, we would also like to save resources. And uh, if you don't aggregate each route that is advertised, so imagine you advertise hundreds of uh, slash 32 rather than one longer prefix, uh, we'll be instantiated in forwarding. So LPM, it will eat memory, it will eat forwarding resources. Most importantly, you really want to decouple amount of state from number of endpoints connected. So again, imagine you have 128 or 256 port switch, and uh, you have 128 servers connected to it, just give you a really large number, right? So if you don't aggregate, you'll end up potentially with uh, slash 31 per, uh, per link. So multiplied by 31 by 128, multiplied by number of links, suddenly you end up with routing table of tens of thousands of routes. Yeah. And again, it's memory, it's resources, uh, make conversions slower. So rule of thumb, and this is for single tour deployment. So if you use dual tours, it's very different because then you cannot really aggregate because, so we call it any cost, right? So you'll advertise same IP address from both uh, tours or dual tour scenario. Right. So if you aggregate and you lose something more granular than your aggregate, you wouldn't know that you shouldn't be using this particular switch. But dual tours are not common. So if you're in single tour scenario, aggregate will do a lot of good for you. So basic rules, use 31s. I know some people don't like 127s on in IPv6, use 64s, really. I'm yet to find reason not to use 127. I mean, there's years of discussions and different opinions practically just work. So sometimes you see links being redistributed into BGP. Don't do this. They're not needed. And if you use your interface IP address to do something, you are doing definitely wrong. Oh. Uh, the EBGP as IGP relies on the fact that next hop is available locally as connected routes, and this is how you resolve. So it's recursive resolution over connected. The route is local to you, and it's not needed in BGP. Don't pollute your routing table. So allocations, use slash 31, or maybe slash 30, or if you need for whatever reason, and aggregate them. If you have to have layer two, use SVIs. And again, SVI will give you already shorter prefix. 
don't sum summarize in the fabric and really understand what you are doing. Otherwise, you will black hole in the next compiler and touching on overlay. You can follow exactly the same domain and same principles if you do overlay. So rather than uh, using route type two, learning MAC addresses, R pink learning uh, layer three bindings, and then using for routing, use routing. So in this case, you're going to do it per tenant. Again, imagine you have 10 ports on which allocate a single tenant. Use slash, 120, slash 27 to aggregate them, advertise single route. You don't need any breaching unless you do some weird stuff. Yep. Uh, so multiplanar topologies. Uh, if you build larger networks, at some point you run out of parts, right? That's simple as it is. Practically, uh, in least fine topologies, if you're large enough, inevitably you will need to build a smaller deployment unit. We commonly call them pods or mm -hmm. deployment. So the common rule is that all the switches within pod are fully meshed, right? This goes back to very fundamental uh, point of least by network uh, where endpoints are equidistant. Right. Right, so uh, in most cases, the merge point is leaf. So only leaf is connected to all the plane. After you leave, after you leave a leaf, which is local hashing decision, you end up in a plane, and plane is physically wouldn't allow you to leave plane unless you reach another. Right. So this is how we scale, because now we can reduce full immersion to a particular plane. And I think this picture represents how a multiplanar topology looks like. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you grow towards particular size, this is the only way to really scale. And it's very easy to add capacity. You just increase number of planes. And since you only need to be fully immersed within the plane, you can reach pretty large, large numbers. So if we look at 128 port switch, uh, you can reach uh, 8K endpoints in uh, interstate network. And this this multiplanar topology is something, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe that uh, this was something that Facebook first explored with their Altoona, or at, le at least they were the first I saw that advertised this kind of design uh, may not have been the first to explore it, but uh, in their Altoona data center, maybe what? Yeah, so there's uh, definitely a very, very good, very good post uh, from Facebook engineering team on how this works and all the kind of benefits of using it. There's a number of older uh, papers uh, on NSDI and CCOM talking about quasi fat trees and multiplanar. Yeah. So there are academical papers that described it before. Practically, or not practically, this is very practical approach to scaling out your network. It's mm -hmm. pretty much the only way as well. It's also very, very important from management and maintenance perspective. So imagine you have four planes and you need to do maintenance. If you take one plane, you know that you've lost exactly 25% of capacity, not yeah. more, not less. Imagine you also have proper workload placement and proper <laughs> change management in place. So you can actually go and reduce total load or total amount of traffic generated towards the fabric by 25%, right? Yeah. It allows you to do maintenance uh, that doesn't disturb any ongoing work, it doesn't disturb your customers. And so from planning perspective, it's very, very important. Okay, how are we doing on time? We have 40 minutes. No, we're so, uh, so another reason is to use BGP. If you look at any hyperscale BGP configuration, probably the 80% of this configuration are going to be community settings and route maps based on those communities. Yeah. 
right? So networks are large, they're interconnected. You would really like to be able to react on some changes that are happening further away. You would like to be able to react on particular changes that might be happening down of you. And BGP gives us this amazing way to encode metadata in communities. You can encode Shakespeare if you like, especially if you use large communities. Hey, Jacob. <laughs> so uh, if we look at operational practices, in large data center running BGP, all of this stuff is community-based. Mm -hmm. If you look at maintenance, again, all of it is community-based, right? So it's a very important point to understand that when you start operating your data center at scale and you need to influence, uh, you need to change the best path selection based on some external factors, BGP, provide this ability like no other protocol. So we didn't talk about Rift. We are not talking about Rift here. Rift converges faster than anything we described right now. Mm -hmm. Rift gives you natively ability to encode metadata and provides in-band uh, communication channel. But that's all. Obviously I'm biased, but you know, kind of when we were designing Rift, we were seeing what are we missing. Okay, so let's look at conversion. Our goals are detect failure as soon as possible. Use BFD, so fast failover, next hop tracking, our neighbor, vendor knobs, I think they're like mostly Cisco. Practically what it does, when there's a lost or reachability, don't wait for BGP to run another 30 second uh, wheel and then uh, detect that there's actually a failure. I know there's no BGP implementation data that does it. They're all event driven practically. You would like to know about failure of next hop as soon as it happens, ideally in the middle second. You want to process updates as fast as possible. So we are going back to path hunting. You want to have single path that best pass, you process your data. You update your forwarding, you advertise it to your peers. Propagate failures as fast as possible. Uh, so MRI stands for, we discussed before, for uh, minimum uh, re-advertisement interval. Mm -hmm. And what it really means is that after you've advertised first update, you would wait some time before you would advertise second update. On the internet and all that kind of makes sense because you don't want to bug your neighbors every time there is something changes and given kind of uh, asynchronous way of internet working, you will receive this update in different times from different neighbors, right? Mm -hmm. So this was done to kind of stabilize it, wait 30 seconds till you receive all the updates, run best pass, and then advertise it to your neighbors. In data center, it's actually counterproductive. You would like to advertise as soon as possible. So in most implementations, MRI timer for eBGP is set to zero. It is uh, zero by default in FRR. If you happen to run all the version of Quagga, and I know there's still some around, uh, it has default MRI of 30 seconds. Please go and change it. You especially don't want to be in situation when some of your BGP speakers use MRI of zero and some others not. There is great paper by Jen, uh, Jennifer, Jennifer, Jennifer. So she, she's a professor uh, at uh, Harvard, and uh, she explains the consequences. Uh, so another thing, and it's kind of already built into BGP, practically you can break it by configuring different policies for different peers. So you want your update group to cover all of your peers. So don't use different policies when you go up or down in the list find apologies. You want to generate a single update, send it to everybody at the same time. Uh, so forwarding plan conversion support is not a BGP feature, it's a forwarding feature. It's supported on all modern silicon. What it means is that, so in this kind of a QD apology, every pass is loop free per definition, mm -hmm. right? 
So in a CMP set, all routes are distant and are as good as anything else. So practically, you don't need to run best pass to figure out which is the next best pass for you. You know that your ECMP set is as good as your primary. So what you do in forwarding plane, you remove the uh, felt uh, path, not path, it's wrong, right? uh, link or interface from the ECMP set or ECMP array, mm -hmm. and you, re you rehash remaining flows or packets around healthy paths. So you do it in forwarding. And then BGP takes time to converge. It's irrelevant from the subjective because again, it's an ECMP set. So all your uh, alternatives are loop free and as good as primary. So back to kind of chatness of BGP in comparison to IGP. There's implicit withdrawals and, uh, and route suppression. So let's describe what it is. So implicit withdrawal Imagine you advertise a route from super spine to all your spines. So you also learn it from other spines. Right. And you've lost link to one of your spines. So the destination is still reachable through all other spines. Right? So what's happening here, you didn't lose reachability. There's some change in route. The change could be relevant if the neighbor you just lost is happened to be your best pass. So it's IS pass, it's IS, ISN is actually in the IS pass. So the BGP route you are going to advertise to your peers is going to change because now you're going to choose another best pass and it will have another IS number in the IS pass. So you will run best pass, choose new, new best pass, and advertise it to all your peers. So this is what we call implicit withdrawal. So you didn't change the reachability, you changed the BGP attribute, namely IS in the IS pass. Mm -hmm. So all BGP implementation today are treated as non-traffic affecting, so you will only update your BGP without propagating the changes into data plane, because practically there is no change to data plane. So that's one thing about BGP. Another one is, as we described, there is reduction, right? So anytime you receive a route from number of peers, you will reduce it to a single best pass and then advertise it to your neighbors. So by structure of the kind of leaf network and inherent behavior of BGP, you reduce amount of information that need to be distributed because for all practical reasons, this additional information is irrelevant. It doesn't change anything in behavior of the protocol. So I'm using here pretty generic timers. Could be different for highly optimized BGP stuff, but practically let's take a look. So failure detection, which is, again, one of the most important contributors into overall conversions time. Yeah. Uh, if you lose the link or light, so, or you lose BBB session, it could be as fast as one millisecond, even faster. So it's really driver notifying uh, the forwarding logic. Hey, I just lost the link. However, if you are not losing BV, or if you're not running BFD or you are not losing link, it could take by default up to 180 seconds. We know that defaults in many OSs today are still uh, uh, keep a life of 60 seconds with whole timer of 180 seconds. So don't be that guy. Don't wait for three minutes to figure out something is wrong. Use BFD. Uh, be cognizant about uh, importance of uh, time to detect the failure. So fastly harsh, uh, again, could be somewhat slower, could be somewhat faster, depending on the vendor, silicon, OS, usually around 10 milliseconds. So fastly harsh, 
mean that we can send traffic through everybody else bothering fail. Now we need to notify BGP that something has happened, right? So again, we've got whole path from very, very down to hardware, driver interrupt, all the way to the routing protocol. So best pass trigger, right? You are going to start running new best pass, eventually update routes and send them to your neighbor. So we can say it's about 30 milliseconds. Best pass computation, again, average number probably was typical CSP scale. So 40, 70 K routes would take you about 100 milliseconds average. And there are other stuff that can do it probably in 30, but irrelevant. So then you need to install routes in uh, RIPs. Uh, number for FRR as of today would be 1 million routes in seven seconds, which is uh, pretty much in line with industry, I would say. Yeah. Then we look into installation in forwarding, and this is where it becomes interesting. Uh, so depending on efficiency, depending on uh, whether you shared memory or some centralized databases, the it could go from probably 1K routes up to 50, 60K routes on the high-end platforms. The difference is really significant. And again, as we said, if there are significant differences in uh, download speed between directly connected neighbors, you might end up with uh, the forwarding loop. Mm -hmm. So in BGP, by default, it happens in parallel with updating peers, unless you configure wait for install. In this case, you will actually wait till all the routes get downloaded. You will get ACK to BGP and then you'll start downloading. So there's no loops in this case, but your convergence time just quadrupled. And then peer updates, again, could be anywhere from 50 to 100K routes per second. And this is pretty much your timing. So in leaf spy network shouldn't take more than three, five seconds. Practically, if you see that convergence time is longer than that, you've done something wrong. There's either pass hunting, so again, your allocation scheme, something else, or something funky is really going on. Maybe, again, you're creating some loops. Maybe your policies are inconsistent. So practically, if you run out of this time, something is really weird happening in your network. Uh, we are 52 minutes. Uh, so we can discuss some other stuff or so I actually wanted to discuss weighted ACMP, but I think it would be a good topic for maybe next meeting. Yeah, I was just looking at a couple of questions that we've got uh, coming in. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, Josh Ingle is, is saying, hey, Jeff, don't know if he means you or me, probably means you. Uh, says, how would you configure uh, the... Uh, um, firewall plane convergence. Is this just simply manipulating the logic of a router's forwarding information base? Is this uh, achieved using the implicit withdrawal technique? Question mark. I'm sorry, I I, I lost your first uh, probably five seconds of the question. Could you uh, yeah, he's saying uh, um, there it is. Uh, Robert just just flashed it up there for us. Can you see it on your screen? Uh, if I stop sharing, I would. Oh, okay. I can. I can. Uh, there we go. Uh, let's see. How do I stop sharing? Stop sharing. And then, yay. Okay. So. You don't really configure forwarding plane convergence. Usually it's done by your ASIC and, and your vendor. So uh, make sure it's actually well supported. I've seen really bad bugs in this area on pretty much every vendor, right? So especially fast rehash is important. It requires proper programming uh, logic. And uh, what's also important is that you don't go up to get down. So if you look at notification flow, 
uh, your optic at layer one will detect loss of signal, right? Should be layer zero. Right, it will notify driver, interrupt, go all the way up to RIP, and then RIP will say, hey, reconfigure the routing. You definitely don't want this to happen for uh, for your forwarding changes. What you want to happen is at the moment failure has been detected, it needs to immediately remove the pointer to fail link from the CMP array. Again, all the OSs uh, I've been dealing with do this. Some do better, some do worse, some do in software, some do completely in hardware. Practically, you definitely need to test it. Uh, there's one more thing. Now I remember my Microsoft troubleshooting days. Uh, <laughs> some vendors implement dumping. So there's a timer before there's a failure of a link and the system actually get notified about it. Uh, I remember on one particular render it being 100 milliseconds. So for 100 milliseconds, you actually don't know that you lost the link. So it's done for stability reasons. If your link is slapping, you definitely want to suppress, right? Yeah. So you don't want to go up, down, up, down. Practically for 100 milliseconds, you don't know that you've lost the link. So if uh, conversion speed is important, if packets are expensive, mm -hmm. think about machine learning clusters, <laughs> make sure you notify your subsystem about failure as soon as possible. So all this dumping should be set to zero. All right. Yeah, and I, I, I feel kind of funny. I uh, When I was first, I was just reading that question across, and I saw F, FW and I said firewall. When I see FW, I think firewall. And then I thought, well, that doesn't make sense <laughs> until I realized he was saying forwarding plane. Um, there's another question that um, I think it might be better addressed in another show. Uh, um, well, let's let's talk about this one first because this is more practical. Uh, what are the limitations uh, on the number of ECMP zones per VRF? Uh, I'm not that? sure about connection to VRF. So your ECMP set is out, right? So mm -hmm. VRF usually means that you have some sort of hierarchy. So there's an overlay, right? So practically your ECMP set is that of your underlay next hops, not your overlay. Obviously there's dependency, right? There's yeah. no free lunch. But practically I'm not sure ECMP zone. So probably mean ECMP set. So again, those are pretty much independent. Right. Obviously, there's some dependency in how you process it because when you receive a packet, you need to look it up and then you need to resolve it over a particular ECMP set. Uh, so those are hardware limitations in most cases. So yeah. usually your ECMP set is a combination of software and hardware. So from routing protocol perspective, you would usually have a uh, largest ECMP set configured. So we all know configuration like EBGP, IBGP, CMP, 54, 128. Yeah. Uh, so that's practically it. Usually it kind of protects you from overloading your forwarding plane, which is incapable of building uh, ECMP set larger than particular size. Yeah. And there, was a, there was a question that, it was actually the first question that came in and I, I kind of, uh, yeah, there it is. I, um, I somewhat avoided that one because I think that is more of a topic for a different show um, on, you know, how do you see BGP IPv4 um, moving forward? You know, who knows in the next five or 10 years, but, uh, um, but uh, you know, I think, I think that that probably is, is something well, especially since we have one minute left um, that, uh, uh it would be a good topic for for another show, um, but... Uh, uh... Absolutely. So IP4 didn't really change, right? And it's not yeah. going to change significantly going forward. Yeah. What's changing is BGP transport. It's not changing yet, but we are working. So there is a draft called BGP over quick. Yep. And it will provide really cool stuff such as, uh, I mean... Quick is a really cool protocol in a way it allows mobility, it allows multi, it allows uh, multi-session streaming. So 
we all seen, so four days ago, there was huge instability because of ABGP, new attribute, actually attribute 28, uh, signaling uh, encapsulation of, uh... so anyway, there were routers that were allowing it to pass through. They were out and saying, hey, I don't know who you are. Let me drop the session. Yeah. So you know what happens when you start dropping the GP session all over the internet. It's not mm -hmm. helps you. So practically, BGP over quick will allow you, it will allow you to drop only BGP session for particular AFI SAFI where this kind of error has occurred. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's just one of the things. Um, so I'll invite one of my co-authors on the draft to our show to talk about it. Uh, we just published the draft last ATF in reasonably readable state. It's early days. We received some pretty good comments. Practically, it's a great development. And I believe that eventually Quick is much better transport for BGP than TCP. Again, my personal opinion, obviously. A lot of tomatoes will flow, but you know that's what we are doing. Uh, just... There's another part of the world, and I'll finish. There's part that I'm very involved right now, which is kind of machine learning clusters. There is pretty much no IPv6 there. It's all IPv4 based. Yeah. Okay, um, so. Yeah, no, I, I was just going to say, maybe it's a little bit of a teaser. Somebody, I had a discussion with a friend at the last IETF that you and I were both at in San Francisco. Um around uh, delay tolerant networks. And uh, I actually hope to get him on the show as a guest. And, and he has a little bit more work he wants to do and said, yeah, maybe after the next IETF, I think he's going to do some presentation there. But, but uh, just as a little teaser, um, you know, the idea there is, um, um, you know, NASA, for one, is, uh, is saying, well, you know, there's there's work that's been done on delay tolerant networks and that sort of thing, uh, but you know TCP/IP is an established protocol, and this is where Quick kind of comes into this. One it made me think of it, uh, but um, um, you know it's an established protocol. We don't want to go to move to something entirely different as we establish uh, bases uh, on the moon, which is not all that problematic, uh, but somewhere in the maybe foreseeable future bases on Mars, you know, where speed of light might vary between four minutes to 20 minutes, uh, depending on the position of the planet. And how do we still run IP networks uh, reliably, you know, with that kind of variability and that kind of delay? And um, uh, there's some interesting work going on there, but I wanted to throw that out just as a, as a teaser, uh, I, I want to have him on the show eventually and, and uh, to talk about that, uh, you know, something people like Vint Cerf are involved in and um, could be a fun discussion. Absolutely. So there's two kind of ongoing topics in ATF. One of them is uh, how do you send email to Mars? I'm sorry, say that again. How do you send, send an email to Mars? Yeah, exactly. Another one is routing in the kind of uh, low orbit satellites mm -hmm. because you're not always connected, right? Depending on your position, you might lose connectivity for 30 seconds and reestablish it. If you do this to OSPF or ISS, they'll be highly unhappy. Absolutely. Another interesting property, you know in advance when you're going to lose connectivity, when you're going to reestablish it. So how do you build this knowledge into routing protocol behavior? So we are having these meetings in a routing working group because they're kind of more research than something that, I mean, there are satellites, there's whole uh, Elon Musk stuff that's in the sky, yeah. right? And yeah. guess what? It all, it all runs routing, probably BGP, mm -hmm. right? So how do you make it work better? How do you make part of your knowledge about links appearing, disappearing as part of your routing algorithm, part of your adjacency building, this kind of stuff. So it's really interesting work and we are definitely going to cover it in our future. Uh, yeah. Contest. Great. Okay. Well, I think we need to, we're actually running over a little bit from, um, 
from our usual stop time, but uh, this has been a great discussion. And and uh, Jeff, I I really appreciate all the thought you've put into to this discussion. I I was kind of just like most of the audience uh, in listening mode uh, during all of this, and and uh, um, uh, it was I don't even know if I want to call it a discussion. It was a really good presentation. Um, Thank you. And, uh, you know, be, be, being on rotation in Microsoft for two years, I mean, it doesn't really matter whether you are really young network engineer or senior principal as I was, you have to do rotations. You eat your yeah. own dog food. It, you see stuff that you would never imagine possible, and you learn so much by just, you know, having your hands in production, mm -hmm. configuring, configuring stuff. You know, at the end, you just SSH into device and you start digging at the forwarding table. And why your BGP looks one way and your uh, ASIC looks another way. I mean, regular stuff, but when you see it at scale, it, it shows you really interesting perspective to all of that. Absolutely. So I want to thank all of you for uh, in the audience for joining us. And um, by all means, I don't think I've said this in a while, but, uh, you know, if you're uh, please follow us on Facebook, uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and uh, we'll see you back again in two weeks. See you, Jeff. See you. Bye, everyone.